Hey everybody, welcome to Mad in Science. We're doing another flipped classroom lesson. This time it's all about population. And instead of trying to make it like really long, I'm gonna try and split this guy up into two. So first video, you can follow the same old rules. So flip lesson ideas, you can read them there. Probably most importantly, the last one. Make sure you add a comment at the end that is specific and cool and timely and related to what we're doing. I've got a lot of examples in here. So find a new one. I look forward to reading all about it. For this video, we're in unit three for the AP Environmental Science curriculum. And we're going to really just do kind of the non-human specific portion. So keep in mind, humans are going to apply to all of these areas. But for population ecology, we're going to go three, one to three, five. First video is going to focus mainly on introduction to population ecology, so the general parts. We will get into survivorship curves and population growth and resource availability a little bit. The other portions are going to be saved for next video. And then the human parts are going to be mostly done in class. So if you look at the hierarchy of biological structure, you can see we're zoomed in on the populations, I guess, in between organisms and communities. So a whole lot to learn and investigate in here. We're just going to cover the basics, just get to the tip of the iceberg. So here the unit is at a glance. Here's some ideas for instructional activities. We also got for this video the learning objectives. So highlighted here for the different sections, 3.1 and 3.2, and then 3.3 to 3.5. This might be a decent place to pause it just to look. Maybe also come back to this section at the end and see how it is that you've, you know, come to understand these different areas. All right, let's start with just the general features of a population. Most basically, you've got how big it is, how many individuals are there, how dense is a population, and where are they located. So size, density, distribution. If you look in here, we are all about population ecology as opposed to, or really overlapping with, other areas of ecology. In terms of counting, so size, how many are there? Here's an interesting kind of view into research methods determining the size using mark and recapture methods. What I'd like you to do is pause and take a read of this, get down this formula, oops, get down this formula, and also show the results work. In class, we'll try and change those up and maybe use a different population to do some calculations on. Um, here's another example just with the graph that shows J, K, and L pods of killer whales or orcas. And much of their data is taken from taking actual photos of the dorsal fin. Counting up fish. That's what I did over the summer with Noah's teacher at sea. So Cephas Fish Count, Southeastern Fisheries Independent Survey. So counting up fish every day, catching them, but also looking at them on video camera. Here's our procedures. Here's me measuring and weighing. Um, you can go back and take a look at my blog. So you probably already did, but in case you didn't, probably the blog that's most specific to counting up and how it all works is seen here from Otolithia and the tragedy of the comet. So if you peek in at this, you can get a close-up view of what we did specifically with Red Snapper and how it goes from kind of the hard science research and transitions over to the politics that inform the decision making. So jump back over here. Reminded of our class activity with the Great Elephant Census in Africa to count up individual elephants. So we looked at their techniques via HHMI biointeractive video. So super cool. In this case, not using mark and recapture, but using transects. In class, we'll use quadrats. Here are the outcomes of that study. Here's the actual worksheet that we did. So it shows some of the highlight applications that they did. Also a chart using real data from their study that we could use then to figure out area and density. Sadly, here is a 
cover of National Geographic, last of its kind, very sad news, highlighting the death of the last male northern white rhino. When it comes to calculating density, well, it's actually not that much different than what you did in your chemistry or physics class. I'm your density. Where you had mass divided by a volume. Well, a kind of similar approach for density of a population. You're looking at the number of organisms divided by their area. Now, sometimes that might be volume if you're dealing with the ocean or maybe a canopy. So the units would be number and then area is going to come in meters squared or sometimes kilometers squared. You can see kilometers squared is used here. So people versus or over square kilometers showing the distribution of humans and the density. Facebook is using artificial intelligence to help map density. National Geographic also a really cool article showing the classic J curve population growth over the last 200 or so years, predicting maybe 9, 10 billion in the next 30 or so years. These images are really neat. So color coded, head and not just density, by how packed the colors or pixels are, but income level, which you can see on the bottom from low to high, or kind of oranges up to blue. Different indicators are included on here. If you go down the side, not just population, but life expectancy, um, death rate, um, sanitation, infectious disease, education, literacy, fertility, um, migration, really interesting and fascinating um, measurements. Here we can see a really cool, not just flat or 2D map of population disease, but 3D also includes Terry where I grew up in New Jersey. Take a look at population mount. So if I back this up a little bit, you can see as we scroll up, instead of just 2D, these folks have made it 3D, which is really fascinating. So you can zoom in and out. Here's the whole world. You can see differences between LA and Jakarta, so in Indonesia. You can scroll through different views of Paris. So I encourage you to jump on this website. I'll link it in the bottom. So this is just a slide of the same views we just saw. Here's a similar view that's showing, this is from the website The Pudding, by the way. Not sure where they got that name. Uh, it shows Tallahassee from about 40 years ago, and or 30 years ago, sorry, and Tallahassee, Jacksonville, Central Florida. This map shows human population across longitude and latitude. Here's World Mappers that gives kind of a bigger view or a smaller view based on population density. So density is figured out by how many and then the area. So you want to figure out how many individuals are coming in. So natality or births and immigration are the positive, adding to the population and deaths and emigration would be the negative. Note, I threw in a diagram from 2010 census. We got another one coming up in 2020. Maybe you've heard about it on the news. Here are the countries listed by population density. List of United States states by density. Then an apes math prop. So pause it, write this down, show your work in your notes. Four million people living in Los Angeles. LA has an area of 1,300 square kilometers. What's the population density? Don't forget when we jumped over to Gapminder, which is crazy cool. So we can do population growth, switch this up over here and do life expectancy on the y-axis. And you can back this up and see, I got data back to 1962. You can click on different countries. It's pretty much endless fun playing around with this, looking at the different stats. You can change Y and X. Again, we're mostly in a population, so click on that. Population, population density, age, age structure. You can also play around with other features down on the bottom of this website. Cool, so moving on. Some things with population we're gonna deal with later. 
So when we get to the human parts, we'll talk about sex ratio, fecundity, and age structure. So those sections for um, class would be 3.6, 3.7, 3.8, and 3.9. But in this video, we're talking about location. So patterns of dispersion. So definitely going to be contingent and dependent upon environmental and social factors. Here's what we mean. If you're talking about clumped dispersion, you might have that based on social and resource availability and behavior. So a wolf pack, group of meerkats. So a wolf pack going to work together for hunting. Meerkats work together to avoid predators. So they stay clumped. In case of uniform, influenced by social interactions, like territoriality, perhaps autotoxicity, where you got to stay a certain distance away because of accumulation of waste. So penguins, in this case from South Georgia Island, or saguaro cacti, beautiful examples of pretty uniform distribution based on largely resource availability and social interactions. And then sometimes you might get a random dispersion. So these would be position of individuals independent of others. So spiders or dandelions, those might be examples of random distribution. So kind of a next layer of population above size, density, and dispersion might be the dynamics, so the things that are changing, growth rate, natality or birth rate, mortality, and migration. Same old figure that we saw earlier. You can look at the rates of these if you take that number and divide it by time. That would be our rate, as seen here in activity we did the other day. So if you hadn't finished this, it might be good to do year one, two, three, and four. Another view on population change in the equation. Again, it's just the pluses and the minuses. Put them together, you get the total. For a lot of cases, you more or less assume that immigration to immigration either balances or is zero. Here's a view at live migration maps from some birdies here in the United States. So if we run this, you can see these guys rolling through. It's pretty fascinating. See this image that shows human or homo sapien migration originating about 200,000 years ago in Great Rift Valley in Africa. A very important but also sad and harrowing article from Jeffrey Sachs, we are all climate refugees now. Uh, so Jeff Sachs, one of the great thinkers in our life, in our time, coming from Earth Institute at Columbia University. You can see in Science Magazine, rapid range shifts of species related to climate change. You can see the abstract that highlights, in terms of elevations, you're getting a change in about 10 or 11 meters per year as they move up in elevation up the mountain. And in terms of latitude, 16 to 17, 16.9 kilometers per decade. Here's an image that shows species range shift. And if you look over at the article from Science Magazine, it includes some really interesting diagrams. So this is on biodiversity redistribution. So the same figure we just saw more climate-driven changes, the greening of the Arctic, mosquitoes and vector diseases changing location, and all of this stuff is pretty scary. Climate feedbacks. All right, if we move on, section 3.3 is on survivorship curves. So we spent time on this in class. They start with life tables. So going back, how many are there? What are the rates of birth and death? In this case, you see the data for barnacles. Probably most common example in books is going to be of Belding's ground squirrels. So what do I got? We've got age, number of live at the start of the year, proportions, death rates, in this case, average number of offspring. Now, interesting that they call it life tables when in fact it's looking at uh, mortality rates. If you graph that building ground squirrel, you would have a curve that looks like this, a pretty linear straight line relationship for both males and females. 
Now there are other shapes for these curves. So there's type one, two, and three. Humans are type one, so they're late loss, large mammals. So very low mortality rate early on, and then pretty steep decline at the end. You have squirrels, rabbits, mice, songbirds, small mammals that are gonna have a pretty relative, pretty constant change throughout their whole life and others that have early loss and then a lower late loss. This might be a good place to pause it and look at the comparisons between type one, two, and three. Keep in mind, not everything fits exactly into those categories. That's why in the bottom of the arrows show that it is definitely a spectrum. So some large mammals that we looked at in class were doll sheep. So their survivorship is based on this. So we gave you initially just age intervals and surviving at the beginning of the interval. From that, you're able to figure out number dying, surviving as a fraction, mortality, and multiply that by a thousand or surviving by a thousand and you get how many survived per thousand, which we can then put into a graph, and it shows up like that. So a pretty clean and neat survivorship curve that is a type one. Note that the y-axis over here is logarithmic. We also did this for real, out when we went to the cemetery. So Old City Cemetery shown right here. Here's the data that we came up with. So chronicled nearly every gravesite in here for born, died, age, and sex. We take that same count, gave us a very similar distribution here of type one. Here it is overhead. You can see the grave sites. You can take a walking tour of Old City Cemetery. It's also interesting to note that different populations encountering different stresses have slightly different shapes to their survivorship curves. All right, that is it for this lesson. Please make sure you put a comment down below. Again, we want it to be specific and cool and tied to one part of this lesson. If you have other feedback for me, that'd be great. We'll see you in the next video. Thank you.